Kills, um, and I've been there about six years, and one of the areas I oversee is our uh, food and beverage. And I'm Lisa Swartz, I'm the dietitian for the facility, and I've been there for two years. And I'm just gonna talk about our, the food service today, um, what we do at Meadowlark. Um, we are a non-for-profit organization. We're licensed for 134 in healthcare, 38 in assisted living. To give you an overview, um, we have, so we have a, the main kitchen, and so it produces uh, food for lunch and dinner. And so we also have, in five of our houses, we have a dining room and also a kitchen. And in that kitchen, some of the equipment we have, we have an oven, we do not have a stove top, um, we have a microwave, and we also have a warming door. So what we do, and we started our, the different phases in 2000 for Middle Arc is when they started mm -hmm. that. And so what we do for breakfast, um, nothing comes from the main kitchen for breakfast. It's all done in the house. And so for breakfast, there's no set time for breakfast. So it's when the resident wants to get up is when they get to eat. So you may have somebody that may be an early riser and they want to eat at six and maybe somebody else wants to eat at 9.30 and we can do that. Some of the things um, that we do there in the kitchen, it's also made to order. So if you want an egg, we'll make you an egg, um, pancakes, French toast, you like your traditional breakfast items, cereal, cold cereal, hot cereal, we have all of those available. Um, for like sausage and bacon, we do those in the oven, so we have those available for the residents too. Um, so again, there's no time frame for breakfast, um, it's everyone when they want to come out for breakfast. For lunch and dinner, the main kitchen, they prepare the soup, they'll do the entrees, they'll do like the starch items. So for example, if it's like mashed potatoes or a baked potato, they would do those items. We do send them down in a cart um, to the houses, and then we have warming doors that they can put those items into. We do some things in the house that we have the homemakers do. So they will do the vegetables in-house. Um, dinner rolls, they'll make those in-house. Some of our desserts, we have them bake them in the house because we also want to get that smells going in the house for the residents. So for example, cookies. They'll do the cookies in the house or if it's a, like a crisp or a cobbler, those also are made in the house too for the residents. Um, we, we typically, in each house is a little bit different. You may have some residents that like to, to eat a little bit earlier for lunch than the other ones. So it's kind of depends on the house. Would you agree with that, Jamie? Yeah, absolutely. And some people are still eating breakfast when others are ready for lunch. And so those cart schedules are designed um, to get the food to the houses when the first individuals are ready to, to eat, which is, can be interesting with staffing and getting things prepared on time and, and holding for the correct you know, amount of time for temp safety. So I would say like for, for lunch, probably like an hour and a half or so mm -hmm. is when maybe kind of the time frame. I guess there's no set time frame, but that's kind of the time frame when the residents will come in to the dining room to eat their meals is what they'll do. Um, we, we also have like, if it's a corn muffin that's on the menu, it holds up better. And again, to help get those smells, we have them do that in the house versus in the main kitchen. Again, just to, to help with the smells and for the quality of the product too. Right now, for our menus, we have a fall winter cycle, and then we also have our spring summer cycle. And so what we do for right now, we have like two entrees. So like, I guess a traditional menu, we have two entrees, we have a salad, um, we have a soup, a vegetable, and then their starch items, but they can also choose to eat something else. They don't have to eat those items. So for example, if they want a sandwich or a hamburger, I mean, there's other things that we can have available that we keep stocked in the house for them to be able to have um, for those items. Mm -hmm. And then for dinner, um, it kind of, it's like the same thing for lunch is that no set time, but our carts usually go down to the main, to the houses about 4.30. Some of them will start eating at 4.30. Some of the houses, the residents like to eat a little bit earlier. Others, it may be closer to 5 or 5.30 before they start eating. So it's kind of driven by the residents and when they like to come out and start eating. Um, 
one thing that we do di different this year is to help with that quality and for the smells in the houses, we have uh, each day we pick an item from the menu. So for example, in this, we do this in the evening, like for pizza, we will have those items are sent down from the main kitchen. And then in that house, they'll bake that pizza. Again, it just helps out with the quality, also with, with helping to get those smells going in the houses too. So we try to do a few more things in-house versus in the main kitchen to help out with the quality. For our residents, they also have other choices. We do have a restaurant, um, Prairie Star, so they can go down to the restaurant if they would choose, if they like, would like to eat, um, lunch or dinner. We do have a cafe um, that they can also go to. In our cafe, we have a daily special, so it's open for lunch. And so if they would like to go down there for lunch, they can do that. Um, if they want to eat in the room, that's their option. Um, we do have, like, a, the houses have a patio, so if they would want to go out there and eat, they can also do that, too. Um, but, so those are some choices, too. We have, uh, for example, we have a resident one houses that, I think it's like twice a week, she likes to go meet friends from independent living. So she'll go down to the cafe, like for example, maybe Mondays and Wednesdays. So she's going down there every week um, to meet her friends, have her coffee and have breakfast. So we have those options that's also available too. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, we look for is resident input, um, what kind of menu items they would like to have. One of the things I started this year, and I also I got the suggestion from another dietitian um, called Culinary Corner. So what I did for fall winter when I started working on those cycles, I sent an invitation to each house, and so any resident could come to this meeting, and we reviewed items for fall winter menu. So I made a list of the different soups and have them vote what would be your top choices for soup? What would you like to see for the upcoming menu? Also, we did a few dishes, new things for them to try, and they can vote, yes, I would like to see that on the new menu, or no, I would not like to see that. Um, and, and so that was positive. Gonna continue to work on doing that um, spring, summer again, just try and get feedback from residents, because one of the challenges for me is, I think they may like an item, but that not, may not be the case. Um, and the houses still have their resident council meeting, so they're getting feedback from the residents that way too. For um, Thanksgiving, I utilized the culinary corner where they got an invitation to come to this meeting, and so I listed out different choices for Thanksgiving menu. We had a dessert they got to try, we had a salad they got to try, so again, they got to choose these are the items we like to see for Thanksgiving menu. And that's one thing we've done to help get the input from the residents. One other thing that we do, we call it Fire Safety Friday. So the fourth Friday of every month, the, everybody's cleaning their ovens. So the main kitchen is cleaning their ovens, the houses are cleaning their ovens. And what we do on those days is each house is responsible for the menu for those, for the meal for those residents for lunchtime. And so some houses would choose to order out. Um, we have one house that really likes Chinese food, so they'll order Chinese food that day. Or they'll utilize crock pots. Like maybe they'll make chili and they'll put it in the crock pot. Um, there may be another, we have another house that's really good about involving residents. So the residents choose the menu for that day. And so for example, if it was a cucumber salad, those residents are actually helping make that cucumber salad for that meal. So really trying to get the residents involved and letting them choose um, what they would like to have for that for that meal when we're doing the fire safety Friday um, I think other than that anytime a household um, or a resident or a staff member wants to do something different um, of course we have budgets but um, they can always cancel their their menu, their meals from the main kitchen um, and we can also have people other main options um, so if somebody doesn't want the meatloaf they might have a special lasagna recipe that they want so they can submit that as you know a couple days ahead of time um, for the main kitchen to make and send that down. So there's always a lot of flexibility that we're able to have and part of that comes from having the different service areas such as the restaurant um, or the cafe. But we really encourage just the, the households to operate like a house would and you know, whatever sounds good, that's what we're gonna make. And as for in the dining room, we don't have any assigned seating so the residents can sit wherever they would like to. 
And one thing that we put together, we call it a food preference book, and it's a sheet for each of the residents. It has their picture on there, or have their diet listed on there on how their likes, food likes and dislikes, and any other special things we need to know. Like for example, if somebody would need to use a plate guard, that would be listed on there. And so that helps the homemakers to know what diet that resident is to get, if there's any special adaptive equipment um, that resident needs to have. And then, so if you have someone that needs assistance with eating, they're not just set at one table. They get to choose where they would like to sit. Um, and so using that food preference books helps the homemakers and staff know what diet that um, resident should get. W one of the questions I'm sure will come up is like, how do you help control your food cost? Um, one of the things that we do is we utilize the G drive. And so the menu is on the G drive. So each house is responsible. So we have the menu items listed on that G drive for the week. And so the houses go through, and for example, it's soup. They tell us how many servings of soup they want, how many servings of salad, every of the items that's on the menu, they give us a count of how much they want us to send down to their house. And then we tally that so the main kitchen has that. And that's one way of helping to make sure that you're not producing too much. Um, it helps to see. With the fall winter menu, we are doing a menu review where staff will write down, like, did you have a lot of leftovers? Did you run short of something? So that kind of helps her future. So you can see, do those counts need to be adjusted in any way? So that's one thing, one way of helping out with the food cost. We also utilize what we call um, a food order guide. And so each week, the again, the houses will put in, like I need, for example, like milk maybe list on there, orange juice, you know, we need to have four gallons of milk sent down to the house. And so it's those items that they're gonna use for breakfast, all those other items. Um, we send those down on a cart weekly. And then the houses can also like, if I'm out of milk and I need milk tomorrow, there's a daily order guide that they can fill out that will go down on the lunch cart back to the main kitchen. And then evening when the cart is delivered to the house, it will have those items on there so they can make sure that have those items stopped in the house mm -hmm. is another thing that we do. Um, we, again, we are always looking for ways to make things better. Um, one of the things that I'm working on is because for always available, we, we can tell residents what we have available, staff knows, but I'm working on making something, a menu, that actually we can keep on the tables and give to the residents so that they can see what is always available. And so that's something that I'm gonna be working on because we don't have that. Again, we're always looking for new things that we can do. Um, and that's one of the things that we, I will be working on. Mm -hmm. So we had some questions submitted ahead of time. Uh, Lisa and I'll go through. So what ideas for alternatives to a snack cart do you have? One of the things that we've done that we do is like we'll keep out for example fruit so in the houses we'll have a bowl and maybe there's fresh fruit like there's oranges or bananas apples so we try to keep that stock so it's available for residents and they can grab that or we also look at um, getting like a nice uh, clear dome display thing where we can like for example if we had leftover donuts we can put those items in there so those also are available and we do utilize prepackaged items um, but just having them out um, so that, that the residents can um, take them any time that they would like to. Mm -hmm. In an effort to expand our always available options, we want to have an accessible microwave for residents, staff, and visitors use to warm up items like mac and cheese, sandwiches, etc. In our opinion, does this pose a greater safety risk than it's worth for residents? So without knowing the design of, of your specific building, we do have, um, open kitchens for the most part in our households, um, as well as for our staff. We have a staff break room, which we have. We haven't had any safety issues come up with, with our use of the microwaves or even coffee pots, um, anything like that. We do have staff that know how to work all of those though. So if somebody wants mac and cheese and those things, that's where we typically will utilize our staff. Although we may have residents who would rather do that themselves. And, you know, we just need to make sure that our knife drawer is locked and different things in our kitchen are, are locked that shouldn't be out. 
And one of the things we do, I forgot to mention earlier, is we do have a refrigerator that is that the residents can go to. Um, so it's we say it's like the refrigerator. So if they want to go help themselves and get something, they can get it from that refrigerator. So mm -hmm. we do have that available, and it's it's position where um, it's easy access for them to get to. Yep. So that was part of our next question, um, and the person added in here that they don't want to get it, get stuck in a not I scenario for who might be responsible for temping, cleaning, and labeling for that um, fridge that residents share in our kitchen. Our homemakers who do food service, food prep, um, and cleanup, they're responsible for that. We've also had instances where residents will have their own um, fridge in their rooms, um, and it's one of those things that it still has to be temped twice a day, and so we put that on clean um, shift duties is that that has to get temped, cleaned, and we do monitor the food to make sure it's within the three day or seven day window, depending on what the food item is. So something that we've came through and it's always a talking point anytime we have anyone want to have a um, refrigerator in the room, but it's definitely an option. So our next question, how many choices do you allow at each meal and how are you able to estimate how much of each choice to repair to minimize food waste? And Lisa had addressed that one. Typically we have two um, main options. That doesn't mean that there's not an endless amount, honestly. Um, two of our kitchens are full production, or two of our households are full production kitchens. So they can do many things on the fly. Um, while other ones, I'd say the common things that we would make from an always available or an alternative option would be um, sandwiches, you grilled cheese sandwich, a lot of breakfast foods, salads. Um, Lisa, any other thoughts on those? Um, those are the main ones that I can think okay. of that we have. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do you have open dining? If so, what hours and how did you implement it? So we do have open dining. Um, neither Lisa or I were there when we first implemented it. So I don't know if we can address that question. Um, Lacey might later be able to address that question for us. Uh, so what are the residents' top three hot buttons for food service? Only three. Um, I think... I would say one of them, uh, and I'm not for sure what the question, but you know, we, ha we have challenges. And so I think one of them is probably our vegetables as far as um, either, you know, some residents like them overcooked, some like them undercooked, um, just the quality and, and making sure that they don't get cooked too much and so that they become mushy. Um, and so I think that's one of our challenges that we continue to have to work with our staff. Um, as far as on the preparation of the vegetables, and we're really working on trying to, to get them to roast the different vegetables um, that would be better roasted versus steaming them or microwaving them. And, yep. the, I'm sorry, go down. and then I think sometimes um, we, we get it where even just the descriptions of the food items, they don't know mm -hmm. what it is, and so trying to help them working with our staff to know, okay, this is what this item is going to be, so they can also explain it to the resident um, what that particular item is. Um, I would say one limitation that we have with food service is that, especially with our a la carte items or our, our always available items, is truly limited sometimes by the skill of a homemaker or cook, whoever is working, so that's something that we kind of go over that, um, you know, even how many different ways are there to make eggs, and, you know, poached eggs are something that I had to learn how to make, and basted eggs, and um, so there's there's so many different things. So that's where we also want the residents to be involved in Hey, come up and teach the person how to make a certain thing um, But that's that's one thing that that we hear sometimes is that somebody may not know exactly how to prepare something on the fly that that wasn't on the menu And one of the things I wanted to mention is so if we have a resident that like when we have soda, we just have a generic soda that we use so let's say that somebody drinks Dr. Pepper and they really want Dr. Pepper so we also do what's called a grocery order where um, we get from our local grocery store and so the houses have to put it again, we have it on the G drive so they can put down what they want for that grocery item. And for that, like soda, I mean, that is something that the resident, we do charge the resident mm -hmm. for. Um, but if they, so if we have somebody that wants something, it's one person, it's not a lot of people, you know, we take a look at that and then maybe something that we have to charge that resident yep. for. So I guess the thing is, it's not that everything's available. You have to, I mean, there's limitations on some things as far as what you can provide. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. How do you implement changes in attitude from staff in regards to preparation of food items 
with an always available menu? Excellent question. I'd say we still work on that every day. Um, one thing that I would say that we noticed, um, a lot of times our CNAs and caregivers, that's not their maybe goal is to be serving food and making food. And so, you know, giving them some basic skills, but also um, hiring and working closely with homemakers and cooks specifically in those roles. Um, and we feel just better quality of food, people who are truly interested in food impacting quality of life. Um, a lot of times with the CNA, if they're stepping into that role for a day, they may not be as invested in, in the always available menu um, or just not as familiar with the kitchen. So we try to limit how many people are in the kitchen and how many different people um, we're rotating into that role. And I think also with that, to me, it goes with communication and just and problem solving. Um, working, having, working with a different staff and are, is there some problems going on? And so I think for me too is, is communication and problem solving and just talking about expectations um, as a facility, um, this is what our expectations are too um, that we're going to have for the residents available. One of the good things that we did with some of our newer cooks for the main kitchen is they went down and um, worked with the homemakers in the households and did some training there. Um, it kind of just helped know both sides of how things work and give the homemakers and cook some better ideas as well and and just can kind of see from a space standpoint what what we're sending down from the main kitchen and how that impacts the house and kind of the time restraints that they're under in the households as well so next question how do you provide meals 24 7 to residents that want to eat during the night hours my kitchen hours are 4 30 a.m to 7 30 p.m daily we as a facility do not work in neighborhoods we still have long hallways and an old building we have looked into remodeling to accommodate this style of care and that was going to be too expensive. Any suggestions? Um, yeah, I think sometimes we can overcomplicate food service in general and what we want to have available. So by no means at Metal Art can you get anything you want all the time in regards to, to food. So if somebody wants a steak, that may not be possible, especially not at night. So I think it's a reasonable start to, to start with, hey, can we get a microwave? Can we get a hot plate perhaps? If that's something that you can do with you know safety and Food, food guidelines considered, but can you get those things and maybe start with just, you know, eggs or pancakes or um, sandwiches, you know, what, what are the options to start small first and see how that goes over? Um, because it, remodeling can be really expensive. Um, it is really expensive. Um, but I think just starting small and not getting overwhelmed by how many possibilities there could be and just, just focusing on, on, what the initial steps are. What do you need to get the ball rolling? I would agree with that. Yeah, just like Jamie was saying, just, you know, it can be starting small. Uh, it's probably a good place to start out mm -hmm. with. What other questions do we have? Yeah, we have a few here. So um, one uh, home asked, how many residents do you have in your household? How do you manage texture uh, modified diets? How do you manage ensuring residents are offered the appropriate serving size? Yeah, we, so for in our houses, um, for like mechanical soft diet, the um, puree diet, they have the processors in the house, so they're able to, so they do it in the house. Um, so we send down the food and they're doing the house. And so as far as to ensure on the serving sizes, we have a, what we, I call the spreadsheets, that will have listed out um, for each uh, diet and what their appropriate serving size is for. So that's available in the house. And then, uh, and personally, a lot of times too, I just go around checking because, um, you know, one of the challenges is you have new homemakers, you know, with new staff and just checking to make sure they're understanding it, that they have the correct portion sizes they're using. And so we have that book available for them that they need to refer to, to know what the portion size should be of those items. And again, for if they're grinding the meat, they're gonna grind it in house um, is how we have it set up. And our household size, anywhere from 13 to 25 residents per house. Um, and we staff the hours differently for the homemaker, depending on the size of the house as well. Um, and, um, I had another thought, but I lost it. So, <laughs> okay. Um, someone asked, "How do you guys do fried eggs without a hood?" So that's good. Some of the areas that we have do have a hood system. Um, we have tried different things. So at one point, we were able to, when we could still use, you know, Pam spray, we would do that. But 
because of the grease laden vapors, we kind of ran into some issues with that. So um, we have purchased some non-stick griddles that um, are supposed to work without the spray, as well as at one point we bought these as seen on TV, blue Yoshi diamond, I don't remember what they're called now, but these pans and we go through them rather quickly at times, but that's the option that we have um because those are hard other things other kinds of eggs you can actually do in the microwave um and, and getting creative with it but right yeah okay okay um holmes you are welcome to continue to submit questions for uh our hosts um if you have them at this time so that is the end of our question round right now Okay, we're not getting anything. So um, that, if you guys don't have anything else to ask or add, um, we can end. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I will go ahead and everybody else can like just leave the call right now and uh, we can stay on. Okay, it's just this. Lacey, I could just come in there, but I was asking, the dining room seating, uh, is that with, you know, like assigned seating? Is that with food? Yes. Yeah. Oh, dang it. I wanted you guys to say, uh, talk about like when homes say, well, we still have assigned seating, but that's because our residents want assigned seating because they always just sit in the same place. But that's okay. Yeah. I, I should have known that criteria was on there. I, I shouldn't have had to ask. So and, that's and I thought about saying that is that we're creatures of a habit. So a lot of times they'll sit in the same spot, but it's not that they have to, but they may choose to do that. Well, right. it's, it's, right. Right. it's about staff asking them where they want to sit yeah. every time. Right. Exactly. That is like yeah. something about that is a disconnect when we, when it comes to evaluations. So yeah, no big deal though. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Judy, I'm going to end it unless you have any comments. I don't have anything. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bye.